about that? Uh, Edward, I don't see, uh, I don't see Asper. Um, I, I, I had just gone and sat down. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, I think you'll have to be pinned there like a butterfly uh, yeah. when, when I ask my questions because I need to see you being deprived of all these other sensory uh, modalities. So, um, you know, I, uh, you, I've been taking notes quite desperately, as you can see, but I, I, you know, I was very impressed, uh, although you had this disclaimer saying you hadn't worked uh, on knowledge, you actually did look at these proximal intimate senses like um, you know, smell and touch and so on. And you came up with, I think you says, perceptual meanings change mediated by knowledge meanings, which I thought was very interesting indeed. Now, a lot of the audience uh, questions actually re uh, sort of reflected some, my own concerns. So I'm going to be slightly selfish now and uh, kind of locate my questions from where I stand, which is India, which has, you know, all these different language families on which we've been uh, working. And um, so I wanted to begin with a question that perhaps was not addressed, but you may have addressed elsewhere. And that's the business. You know, you said that what you were interested in, uh, let me see what you wrote. You said you were interested basically in looking into the mind. So what does language tell us about the ways in which we think? We think? And uh, you talked about at the beginning of your talk, about the over-reliance over on English and a technological con context in order to frame our theoretical questions. And then you had these um, conclusions like not all senses are equally codable in language about which I have questions. Um, and also the faculty of language does not constrain due to intrinsic cognitive architecture. And I wanted to ask you what you meant, but I'll reserve these questions for later to do with your general conclusions. And I'll be kind of, as I said, selfish and poor from my point of view. So I noticed in the map that India was not part <laughs> of your questioning strategy, the very quick glance, but I am going to ask you about India simply because it's linguistically fascinating. Um, so uh, the first set of questions that I had had to do with um, naming, uh, that is proper names, which did not come up in your thing in your talk, but which has of course been a central area of um, uh, investigation by philosophers, Frege, Russell, you know, Kripke, everyone, Wittgenstein, everyone's had a go at the proper name. Uh, and they have asked the question, why is the proper name so important in language? Because it's also cognitively very expensive to have a separate name for all members of the species and for your children. Now, when I was looking at, so it's like having a name for every tree in your garden, it's expensive and we forget names as we grow older, as you know. Now, but when I looked at India, I found that there were lots and lots of proper names like Sugand and Saurabh and Mahak and Kushbu and all sorts of names, which basically meant, um, which basically referred to the sense of smell. But of course, if you look more closely, they're just differentiating between fragrant smells and then smells which are not fragrant. So it's adjectival, it's not really naming. It's not about naming or having a naming vocabulary for smell. What I wanted to ask you is that in the broader cultural context, if you say that you know, you, good smellingness is more important than say good tastingness, and you find that within the language 
a lot, then could you not get a larger picture of the cultural investment which parents make when they name their children, uh, you know, good smelling, uh, almost as if they're predicting a future for their kids, almost as if they're predicting a smell, they would like a smell future for their kids where this child spread a good aura uh, rather than a good taste. So in that sense, I wondered whether you would see, yeah, and in the Indian context, just to add names like Gandhi, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, who for, means smell, a, a perfumia, one who looks at smell. So there are various caste categories and structural categories in a society like mine based around smell, which are not to do with Berlin and K type naming, but important in a cultural sense. And how would you go, would you first of all be interested in the phenomenon of proper names because they have been categorized as definite descriptions? So they are descriptions. And so I, one, of the, one of the thoughts I had in my mind was whether this was worth exploring or whether proper names seem a category apart um, to you. So that was one question and maybe you can answer it yeah. and then I can go on or whatever. I have several questions yeah. and I'm trying not to replicate the questions which have been asked already, right? Thank you, thank you. No, it's a wonderful question. So um, uh, let me just start maybe by saying that um, the practice of naming uh, people for good smells is also seen in the Aslian languages that I described briefly that have a smell lexicon. So they often use um, fragrant flowers and gingers as names for children. So I think it is something that we do see again and again. And I think it, it raises this other question, which I think is dropped out of like fashion and linguistic anthropology, which is um, uh, theorizing about names. So, I mean, it's interesting that, um, I find it interesting that um, in many uh, communities, of course, you're um, actually using kin terms rather than proper names in reference, um, and that names are not necessarily rigid designators in the sense that they can change over time, so that different life stages your name can change. So I think these are interesting things, especially now that there's a perhaps emerging interest in kin uh, terms and, and the logic of those again, perhaps names will also turn up. So uh, certainly something of interest. And I think you're right in pinpointing perhaps something um, intriguing and in the fact that fragrant smells rather than good tastes are used as names um, is kind of intriguing. I haven't worked in the Indian context, but there's a wonderful book by um, somebody called James McHugh, um, called Sandalwood and Carrion, mm -hmm. where he looks at um, the use of smell in Buddhist, Jain and Hindu uh, texts um, over quite a long period of time. And he has these wonderful descriptions of, um, uh, of um, a Maharaja in India who is going to meet his lover in the garden and he navigates over the garden using his sense of smell. So mm. he can see it's an overcast night, there's not enough moonlight or starlight, so he uses his sense of smell to navigate. And so, there, there, so there's these wonderful, um, yeah, so um, James has written some wonderful stuff. Yeah. But, 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 but yes, I mean, there's still a lot more to do and I'm, and I'm interested. Yes, so you know, so because I was thinking that the kin system is there, but the names are actually more like rigid designators because you, your kinship patterns can change across time. You get married, you move into a different home in the culture in India, but of course that may not be the same everywhere. But the rigid and the rigid 
rigid designator can change because you can be renamed when you go into another household. So in that sense, I think the process of claiming a person, personhood yeah. through names based on the senses uh, could bear investigation. I think that anthropology has always talked about kin's uh, assist, uh, system and the philosophers have talked about um, you know, these rigid designators and definite descriptions and so on. But these two ends, because especially the GPP project, you know, the Geography of Philosophy project, ha involves both philosophers, psych involves philosophers and psychologists and anthropologists. In some ways, I was thinking of that as a kind of pattern, you know, pattern making of ways of thinking, which is important, but but you know, we can we can talk about this more. I like to also ask a couple more questions about um, the lexicon. And of course, um, it's important, um, you know, people have made this point, and I don't know whether this is uh, what your experience is across these cultures, but people have always said that qualia sensations, which are, you know, touch, smell, and whatnot, they uh, were formed earlier in our evolutionary history than the language system. So uh, often the language system, of course, you can didactically point to, um, uh, you know, to red, but if asked to describe it, uh, people struggle a lot. And you mentioned this, move into metaphor. So they will say things like red seems hot or um, and blue seems, in, depending on your language. So in some ways, this move to metaphor or metonymy and other literary forms, uh, and even to narrative, seems, uh, so, so what, what I wonder about is, uh, when you make this move, uh, what is it that you're saying about language and the connection between language and sensation when you um, kind of move to metaphor so fast, um, uh, when you, you know, when you have to describe something and why is it? Why is it that you can't just name? And yeah. I kind of have a related question, but maybe you can answer this one and I'll move on to well, the I, related one. I, I don't know that I have any profound answer to the broader question of qualia and how it maps to language. I think my my question is more modest and I hope more answerable. So it's the relative expressibility of the senses. So why is it that some are more expressible than others? So I think those deep philosophical questions I'm lightly brushing over because I'm not sure that I have the gumption to really wade into that territory. But I think it's still intriguing. Why is it that colors in English um, lend themselves to more um conventionalized methods of course you can say well you, I, I want to get the exact distinction right i'm a i'm a painter or i'm a set designer and it really matters that this purple is this shade and not that shade then then it's different territory but in our general everyday vocabulary we do have these basic terms that are more frequent and they do seem to have cognitive salience so why is it that that happens for color and not for smell or not even for taste? So English has taste vocabulary, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. when I test people experimentally, they are calling sugar solution, well, they're calling salt solution bitter, uh, bitter solution uh, sour, uh, so uh, salty solution sweet. They're mixing them up in these incredible ways. And that's been shown again and again in different labs that English speakers have the lexical resources, but don't seem to be able to map them on to the actual source. Um, and so some mm. of that might be to do with um, linguistic input. So uh, I don't, yeah, I guess, I don't know if it's in the US, but in the UK, there's a drink bitter lemon. 
Mm -hmm. So bitter lemon is it predominant taste is sour, not bitter. So it does have a bit of bitter in it, but that's not the predominant taste. And so perhaps part of what's going on is, is just as a language learner, as a kid, I'm having to figure out what's the quality here that this term refers to, and I'm getting input that's not really a good indicator of what that is. So, I mean, it's a chicken and egg question, but at least part of the issue here seems to be the, the language input. So English speakers don't seem to be doing terribly well, even with the resources that they have, in contrast to Lao speakers or Farsi speakers. So in our study, every single one of the speakers named the tastants exactly the same way, all of the tastants. So they were on, on the mark every single on the time. Money, yeah yeah mm. but, but it, our english speakers are just like oh this is like earwax somebody called a sugar solution coca-cola <laughs> so it's mm. sweet so <laughs> modern technology, technology. Or <laughs> vanilla or you know so i think there's there's something really uh awry there uh so uh this is a bit, I mean, maybe I'm stretching it, but you know, the, uh, Steve's point as opposed to Chomsky's point, that if you have small scale societies, you have much more variation. And obviously that's understandable because of pragmatic proximity and, you know, uh, uh, trust and all sorts of factors. And in large scale societies, there's standardization. Now, the point that you're making here is that, um, you know, it, that there is a kind of English speakers vary a lot. There is non-standardization in English when it comes to these uh, uh, the, yeah, taste and they, they go all over the place. So why is it that they are very standardized on one parameter mm. and non-standardized on the other parameter? I understood the Steve Chomsky question because that's very simple, but this one, I'm really not, you know, it seems to me that even if you're not after the big philosophical questions of why it is that qualia mm have this problem with the evolution. It yeah. still seems that there's kind of slippage here between yeah. the knowledge categories, so to speak. So my, my, my take on that is that um, as, very, as well as these global factors, there's mm -hmm. specific cultural practices that are shaping certain domains. So for taste, I think what's important is that people are um, cooking from scratch. So you need to be able, you need to, I, I, I think um, that what's relevant is that you know when you add a bit of salt to a food that it becomes salty, that you um, mm -hmm. can use uh, different types of bitter and medicine and that they have this quality. So for English speakers, uh, as they've moved away from producing food and understanding how different food stuffs will produce different qualities to just getting prepackaged stuff uh, that has everything there that they're not able to decompose so that's my hypothesis we no, try to we try to test this in our study and um i think the way that we operationalize that um didn't work very well so we tried to just look categorize cultures for whether they cooked from scratch and I think mm. for English, you'd have to say yes, because some English speakers do, even though that's not necessarily what everybody does. So I think to really test that, we would need to do an individual level study, mm. looking at individual practices and how that relates to naming abilities to really see if my intuition here is correct. But, um, <laughs> but, but more broadly, I think there can be overarching patterns shaping yeah. lexicon or naming as well as specific things that shape particular domains. Mm -hmm. So that's how you end up with a pattern that overall, regardless of the modality, you find these uh, patterns and that in addition, there's specific pressures on specific domains due to mm -hmm. cultural practices. Yeah, that seems to me very, very sane analysis. I have a, a, you know, a kind of related question, uh, which has to do with impairment. And this came up in 
in a way, uh, when you were asked the questions about psychotic, you were asked a question about psychotic dreams. My question about impairment was, you know, assuming you have somebody like, and this uh, is quite a basic point, uh, somebody like a Helen Keller, let's say, or who is, um, deprived of the main, you know, these two biggies of vis uh, hearing and uh, uh, what was she and she couldn't hear and she couldn't see, yeah. right? And she very much talks in terms of her uh, um, reliance on smell, she, she describes the smell of an elephant, the smell of the garden, you know, and touch, very much so. So so this may be a dramatic way of putting it, but could you say that if a person in an English speaker is impaired in that way, they're moving towards a kind of Jahai cognitive or um, space uh, where they are sort of, uh, you know, uh, they, so in their heads, they have all these categories, these cognitive categories of touch and smell. But they so the but their codability, what you're calling codability, is low because the the culture doesn't have corresponding terms. So this brings us up against uh, you know Searle's principle of expressibility, which he claims, says that if you can have a thought, you can find a way of expressing it in the language. So in that case, uh, you, would have a, you, you would have a cognitive set of moves, even without necessarily having the vocabulary. And theoretically, you could make up that vocabulary. It would not be quotable but uh, it would still be, it would still express or convey a lot of meaning. So would you just come, I mean, this is just a thought experiment, so yeah. I can't expect you to have experimented on it, but uh, could you just give me a... a yeah, there's, there's lots of um, really cool things uh, in your question there to unpack. So um, maybe to start with, um, in our study, we had three sign languages and our participants were deaf um, signers. And so um, yeah. for the hearing task then, uh, we didn't have data from them. Apart from uh, Karen Emery, um, when she, uh, her lab collected the data for ASL and she gave uh, the deaf participants sounds through the medium of a balloon. So the sounds were played against a balloon, which the um, speakers held, and then they had to describe what they'd they'd heard. Um, and so she did find some uh, iconic strategies that were used. Um, so I think, uh, it, I mean, it's a great question, and 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 it has been uh, looked at in the context of blind people by uh, a classic study by Barbara Landau and Lila Gleitman, who looked at. Uh, how young blind children learn vision verbs uh, and she they find that they emerge at the same timeline as sighted children's use oh. uh, and uh, so because they're getting linguistic input that's giving them the context in which you would use this blind children were using vision vocabulary uh, but then with some interesting twists so when they were haptically exploring something mm -hmm. they would use the vision verb to say they saw it um oh, okay. so, so there were some so so that some some nice uh, developmental research there and then more recently marina bedney has been doing some really nice work with um blind english speakers showing that um they seem to share a lot of the same semantic intuitions about vision verbs so glare peep um mm -hmm. Uh, glance so they know that some vision verbs are short duration and some are long duration um they have yeah so they ha seem to have uh learned a lot of the properties of vision verbs um just from linguistic input so from co collocational information um so i think there's there's great questions and and of course it 
I'm at the Radcliffe Institute this year where Helen Keller was a student and they have her materials and so it, it has occurred to me that I should look to see whether the claims about her sensory vocabulary really hold up looking at her her writings in more detail so I, I, it's a wonderful question and maybe we'll so, have something direct to say about it yeah are we are we up for time because otherwise I have a couple more questions which I'm dying to ask about the subcontinent and if not you're about up for time but I, I think you probably can ask one of the questions that I need to ask uh, so go 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 for for, for the question that I need to ask if you if, if you want. Then... All right. So so Asper, uh, I, the questions I have about conversation. I'm glad you brought it in and body language and gesture and how these are sort of walk side by side. Uh, language and so what I wanted to ask you in general wh whether language is kind of a you know concentrating on language in a way is um, is could be disadvantageous because it blocks off things but the question I want to ask is very much more I don't want to go there because that's a big theoretical question but I do want to ask from the point of view of my again back to my location and <laughs> in my location I've been looking at a particular sensation which is universal which all of us feel, we feel every day on a body clock, but because in research, one uses the sight, sound, smell, gust, gustatory, haptic, and whatnot, uh, uh, spectrum, this particular universal sensation, and it is a sensation, completely goes unnoticed. And uh, the, uh, um, my question was that here it's not a matter of people, a community not having a particular vocabulary or a frame or a technological society thinking in another way. This is about the framers of theory and the West. And the sensation I'm talking about, because I'm deeply concerned about it and I'm researching it, is hunger. So hunger is a sensation, we all feel it, it's evolutionarily programmed, it helps us to survive, it's got so many dimensions. But, but in, the big, in the biggest volume I've seen on sensation, which came out in 2022, hunger is not even mentioned. And in some ways, I wanted you to comment on whether you thought that this was a matter of theory you know theoretical framing and hunger simply doesn't is is a sensation but doesn't correspond to any of the senses um or whether you thought that it was a kind of theoretical blindness which came about uh, in thinking in terms uh, in terms of this particular palette um, so I'd just like your reaction because it would help me to think through the questions. I think um, you're, you're right that our um, current scholarship is still somehow dominated by the, the five uh, model thinking of the senses and it's been critiqued from a number of different perspectives. So in psychology at least there's um, more and more excitement about interception of which hunger would fall under. So feelings yes. inside the body, um, that's emerged. Um, in the kind of anthropological tradition, there's been critique from within the African context, for example, that proprioception is really important and that linguistically it's encoded um, with a basic verb, just as um, vision is. Um, and then the flip side, actually, something that isn't talked about as much is that touch or feel is mm -hmm. really complex. So uh, it's not lexicalized stably across languages, and it seems to encompass a number of different things. So I think there's certainly a lot of scope for um, a kind of reappraisal of, of whether this way of thinking about the senses is still useful and meaningful. 
coming from it from a language side, I think you can be a bit more pragmatic. So it turns out, you know, despite a few caveats that this five, um, five sense model does turn out to have linguistic reality at lot mm -hmm. across very diverse languages. And so that makes it um, interesting as a pragmatic program then interesting to look at. Uh, but pragmatically, one might say that a word for hunger is there in, across languages and that there are, there are words for different types of hunger. Uh, and uh, partially it's related to the sense of taste and to the, because hunger's op opposing is appetite or food, which the Greeks went on about and everybody's talked about. So it's not that this particular sensation, which is extremely debilitating and is very high up on the UN goals, apart, you know, apart from indigenous languages. And uh, yet, you know, there's, a, as I said, it's not that it is not related to some of the senses, but especially taste and um, maybe smell. Mm -hmm. um, but it's neglected because hey, it's not a Western problem, maybe. And also because, you know, frameworks often, you know, they, they don't allow us to see certain problems. So that's just a general problem which I'm struggling with because, you know, when you live inside a culture as well as language, um, often you don't see, you know, you don't see how others don't see this yeah. as a sensation. I feel um, like we could talk about this for hours, Rukmini, but Edward's giving me the eye, so I think yeah. we have to stop. <laughs> I'll just, um, I think we'll, we'll end here. I, uh, the other stuff, I, the other stuff I wanted to talk about was touch and touchability, because of course there are lots of disruptors around it, but we'll stop here for now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Rukmini. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate and thank Aspa for, for, for uh, staying in the uh, uh, exchange. Um, um, I think we will take, uh, let's first thank Rukmini and Aspa again. Thank you. Thank you.